Hi all, welcome to part 2 of this uh, JavaScript tutorial series to create the 1976 game Breakout. Uh, in this tutorial, thanks to a suggestion from one of my viewers, we're going to create a responsive canvas that adapts to the screen size, and we'll add some touch events for, so that people can use it on mobile phones or other touch-enabled devices. So go ahead and open the code, or download the code if you don't already have it. So the simplest way to deal with this is just to change our height here to equal the height of the window. So there is an inbuilt function, so an inbuilt property called window.innerHeight. And what that measures is the height just underneath that toolbar there, down to the bottom of the window. So if we hit reset now, see that the game size is adapted to suit the window size? If we pull that tab out and make a separate window, and just modify its size. It won't change dynamically, but we can add code to do that later. And hit reset. See that it's changed to suit the size of that window? Now, there are a few problems. First of all, there's this margin here, which means that we, get, we have to scroll off screen to see the full game. That's not what we want, is it? So let's get rid of that margin first. So we can do that via the style tags up here. We can just write some CSS. So we can set the margin of the body so body, uh, braces, margin, zero. So that'll set all margins to zero. Let's give that a go. Uh, yep, that seems to have worked. So if we just resize this window, make it a bit bigger, you can see there's no uh, margins around it anymore. However, we can still scroll off the screen there. So we'll have to add something else. So it's probably because our canvas has some default styling. So let's set up the canvas here. Let's add the canvas here, I should say. And we'll change its display type to block because the display type by default is inline, which means it'll follow like a span tag. If we make it a block, it'll be more like a paragraph tag. So let's give that a go, see if that fixes it up. Yep, that seems to have done it. See, there's no more scrolling. So the window is the window and it doesn't go any further. The canvas doesn't extend beyond the window. That's good. But there is another problem. I mean, obviously, if our mobile device is this size, for example, nobody really wants to play a game on the left-hand side of that screen, do they? So we want to be able to dynamically change this uh, game canvas to match the window size and modify the elements of our game to play appropriately. So let's give that a go now. So firstly, let's uh, set the width to equal the window's width. So width will equal window.innerWidth. Let's try that out. Uh, yep, that's looking okay, except that the scroll bars are back here. So I'm thinking that's to do with the overflow. So back in our CSS up here in body, we can set overflow overflow hidden. Let's give that a go. That's looking fine. Let's manually modify the size of the window. That's okay. And maximize it. Reset. Yep, that's looking fine. There's no more scroll bars. The only issue is that we have to modify the size of this paddle and the ball and the walls and so on, and the speed of the ball to match the, uh, to match the height of the screen. So if we had a screen that high, we don't want the ball going so fast, otherwise it's impossible to play, right? So let's fix that up now. So currently ball speed is starting ball speed as a fraction of screen width per second. Well, I'm thinking that should be screen height, based off the screen height per second. But that's because as the screen becomes shorter, we want the ball to slow down, right? And probably the paddle speed here, let's set it to be the same. That is, the ball will take two seconds to go up the screen, and the paddle will take two seconds to go across the screen. Right, so let's go fix up this ball speed. So currently it's ball speed times width. We want to make it ball speed times height. Let's give that a go. So our paddle should take two seconds to cross the screen approximately. One, two, good. And our ball is much slower now because, because of the height. It's a very short screen. If we increase the size of that screen, it should become faster. Yeah, and that's fine. That's playable now. 
Uh, there are a few issues like the position of the paddle and the height of the uh, size of the paddle. It's too far up the screen, isn't it? So let's look at those issues now. So head back up to the top. Okay, so currently we've got height as a constant. Ultimately, we don't want it to be a constant. So let's pull it down here just temporarily. And we want the paddle width probably to be some sort of constant. So we'll put that up here. But instead of being based off its height, how about we make it a fraction of screen width? So we'll say it's say one tenth. So this will be paddle width as a fraction of screen width. Let's go and update that. So paddle width should be down in the paddle function. So this dot width will equal paddle width times the width of the screen. Let's try that. Didn't notice anything there. Oh, there we go. So if we make it as wide as we can, yep, yeah, so it's wider to match. It should be one tenth of the width, so that's okay. Head back up to the top. Because these constants will be changing throughout the game potentially as the screen is resized, they can't be constants, can they? So we'll have to set up some variables. We'll give them the same name except that they'll be lowercase. So height, width, wall. Can you see that ball size and paddle height are just equal to the wall? So we probably don't need them to be separated, do we? Uh, and also you'll notice that height is used throughout our code. It's scattered throughout our code as is width and wall. So we'll have to modify all of those references in there to refer to the variable instead. So usually in most editors you can just right click and change all occurrences. So that's what I'll be doing here. So we'll change that to lowercase. The width will change all occurrences to be a lowercase one as well. And the wall will change to be a lowercase as well. So these no longer need to be constants. We'll just delete that keyword. Now ball size, we no longer really need that, do we? So we can just go change all instances of that. There's only one instance of it to wall and paddle height as well, which is down near the same location. So ball size will equal wall. So the width and height of the ball is wall and the paddle height is wall. So head back up to that and delete those two there. So let's test that out, make sure that we haven't broken anything. Um, it's one issue I can see. So we'll make it thin again, that window. See, that looks fine to me. But when we make the screen very wide, can you see that the paddle is very thick and the walls are very thick? It doesn't really suit. So what we should do is probably base the thickness of the paddle, the thickness of the walls, off the shorter side. So let's make a new constant here. We'll call it wall, capitalized wall that is. And it'll be based off this width divided by 50. How about we put it as a fraction? So 1 50th is 0 0.02. And this will be the wall, ball, and paddle size as a fraction of the shortest screen dimension. Okay, so let's do that here. So it'll be wall, wall will equal wall times the shortest. So if height is less than the width, then we'll multiply by height. Else we'll multiply by width. So let's give that a go. So as you can see before, it was quite big and chunky. Yeah, that's looking okay to me. So if we change the size of this screen, yeah, that's looking okay. So if you could do some really extreme examples here, so for example, if the screen was that, then it's gonna be very thin, but honestly, who's gonna be playing in a screen that sort of height and width? Although you could, it's, we've designed it so that you could. Okay, that's fine. So what else do we need to uh, dynamically change? For example, here, the game canvas, the canvas width and height, that will be based off these things up here. So we'll just paste it there temporarily. The context line width, 
that needs to be changed as well. So we'll go up to here and just paste it there. Uh, that seems to be it. So all of this stuff we'll have to do after we've declared our canvas. So set up the game context and canvas. We'll put that into the same section. So set up the game canvas and context. Derived, not really derived, we'll just call them dimensions. We don't need that pixels there. Okay. What we should do is put all of this into a function, all of this stuff here. So how about we create a function called set dimensions. Let's go down and create that now. Just after serve there, function set dimensions. We'll paste that in there. Let's test that, make sure that we haven't broken anything. Okay, that seems to be working fine. Now, what we can do now, the fact that we have this in its own function, we can set up an event listener so to detect when the window is resized. So head back up to the top, uh, just where we're setting up our event listeners. Here we go. So all we have to do is add an event listener to our window. So add event listener. The type of the event will be resize. And all we have to call is our set dimensions function there. Okay, let's give that a go. Okie dokie. So when we dynamically change this window, it does change. The walls are changing as we expect, but the paddle and the ball aren't really moving, aren't really updating. We can fix that easily enough. Inside of our set dimensions function, we can just simply set up a new paddle and a new ball. So we can go paddle will equal new paddle and ball will equal new ball. Let's give that a go. So change the size of the window. Great. The paddle and the ball are moving with and resizing with the window resize. That's great. The only issue I can think of is if we're playing, if we're in the middle of play and the ball is not on the paddle like that, and then I resize it, the ball immediately gets sent back to the paddle. So people could potentially use it to cheat as such. <laughs> and one way around that would be just to restart the game. If a resize occurs, the game restarts. So you can't cheat. Anyway, let's move on. Let's go and do some touch events. So let's head back up to where we set up our event listeners. These touch events we'd like to apply to the canvas only. So we can go canv.addEventListener. The type will be of type touch. Now there's four types of uh, events here. Touch, cancel, touch, end, touch, move, and touch, start. Let's implement all of them so that we handle all situations. We'll call the uh, names of the functions the same, just with camel case. So we'll have touch, cancel, touch, end, touch, whatever, whatever. So touch, end, was it? Yep. Yeah. Touch, end. There was touch, move. Touch, move. And touch, start, was it? Touch, start. So let's go down and implement those four methods. So just after our set dimensions, function touch cancel, it will take an event. All of these will take events. So we'll do a similar thing for the other three. So touch cancel, touch end, touch move, and touch start. So how do we want to handle this? Well, I'm thinking, let's keep it simple. If the user touches to the left of the paddle, anywhere on the screen, then the paddle will travel left. If they touch to the right of the paddle, then the paddle will travel right. If they're not touching the screen, well, that's a stop. They, the, the paddle should not move. So first things first, the first thing that they'll need to do is serve the ball. So we can just put serve in the touch start. So when, as soon as they touch the screen, it will serve the ball. Now serve inside our serve function, we automatically detect whether the ball needs serving or not. So we don't need to do any extra logic here. 
Uh, next, we'll need to, how about we create a separate function? We'll call that separate function touch, and we'll pass the x coordinate of the touch. So the x coordinate is just the event. There's an array called touches. Now, the reason it's an array is because there could be multiple touches. Somebody could be using multiple fingers on their mobile phone or whatever. Just to keep it simple, let's just use the first touch. We'll say we'll use touches zero dot client x. So that'll be the x position. We're not interested in the y position. They can touch anywhere on the screen they like. So we'll be passing the x coordinate to this touch function. Inside our touch move, we'll just do the same thing. Now for touch cancel and touch end, well, we'd like to stop. We'd like to stop the movement. So how about we pass null? There is no x coordinate. And similarly for touch end, that's when they release their finger or whatever, we will say touch null. So let's create this function above, function touch, which takes an x value, which can be null. So if not x, that means x is null or undefined or whatever, then we want to move the paddle, move paddle with the direction of stop. So basically we want to stop moving the paddle. So we want to do a similar thing for each of the other directions. So else if x is greater than the paddle's x, then we want to move right, don't we? So that means the x is to the right of the paddle's x, we want to move right. And we need to do a similar thing for the left direction. So if x is less than the paddle's x, well, we'll move left. Let's give that a go. Now, obviously the only issue is that my mouse cursor is not a touch, is it? So we can get around that, just make that, uh, maximize that, open up our console. At least in Firefox, there's this little icon here, responsive design mode. So I will turn that on and it will give us a device which we can change between, for example, an Apple iPad Air 2 or a laptop or a Nokia or whatever. We'll just keep it to the default. So that's what it's going to look like on our little screen. Now I can use the keyboard here. That's what I'm using the keyboard. That's fine. I can rotate this device and it's resized. That's awesome. Now how do we test our touching functions? Well, there's a little button here, a little icon called Enable Touch Simulation. We'll turn that on. There we go. Now I'll be using the mouse to simulate touches. So I'll push to the left. I'll push to the right. I'll, I mean, I'm holding. Oops. And there we go. It seems to be working. Uh, just one issue. So if I'll rotate that back, I'll try again. Can you see when I serve, it makes the paddle suddenly uh, jump because I'm calling serve and the move function at the same time. We can fix that up. So just down in our touch start here, we have this serve and touch happening at the same time. So how about we put in a condition if serve, so that means if we're serving, we'll just return. We don't want to move at that stage. And we'll just have to go into serve and return something here. So this is if we're serving down here, we'll return true. If the ball is already in motion, we're not serving, we'll return false. This won't affect anything else. This will be perfectly safe. So let's give that a go. We'll just change to a device that's a little bit bigger, say a Nexus 6. I'll change it to landscape mode. So when I initially touch the screen, the ball should serve, but the paddle should not move. Let's try. Yep, it didn't move, but I can still move the paddle by touching to the left or right of it. Great, or holding the... So all of these clicks that I'm doing with the mouse are actually just simulating a real touch because we have no mouse events in our code. So you can prove the point by downloading this code onto your mobile phone or whatever and giving it a go. And that'll be it for today's tutorial. So today we've done a responsive canvas that fills the screen and modifies the size of the components and the speed of the components to match. And we've also added touch events. So in next tutorial, we'll definitely implement the bricks and smashing those bricks with the ball. So until then, talk to you next time. Bye.